Erica is a freelance science journalist, editor, and author in her book, Gory Details. Yes. Um, Adventures on the Dark Side of Science, Exploring the Truth Behind Many Strange Science Stories. So I get a feeling we're going to learn about poop today, <laughs> bodily fluids, <laughs> other kinds of fun stuff. So I'm really excited. Make sure you've washed your hands. So, always wash okay, your hands. Always wash yeah. your hands. Yeah. And I will let you take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that warm welcome, especially since I have to follow Coleman, who <laughs> gave the most entertaining presentation ever. It was wonderful. So uh, instead of entertaining you, I'm going to turn your stomachs perhaps a bit <laughs> today. Hopefully that will be entertaining as well. Um, so we're going to talk about, about disgust um, and uh, how this overlooked emotion meddles with our minds. Basically because like every emotion, um, we are, are influenced in our thinking and it can sometimes make us um, you know, subject to misinformation or disinformation um, when it's manipulated against us. So I'm going to talk a little bit just about gory details because people always ask me, like, what is this book about? This is a, this is a weird topic, right? So uh, the kinds of themes that I'm covering in my book, Gory Details, are uh, I kind of broke a lot of stories down into three kind of broad categories morbid curiosity, disgust, and taboos. And morbid curiosity being our fascination with death and the deadly. So I've got a lot of stories um, as, that I've covered as a science journalist relating to forensic science um, and a lot of things dealing with death, decomposition, all sorts of things that uh, yeah, kind of fit under the, under the gory category. Um, disgust, which we'll be talking about today, of course, which is an emotional reaction to something that's considered to be gross. And taboos, acts or ideas that are forbidden. And there's, disgust is kind of a theme that runs through the book because a lot of the things that we consider to be taboo socially uh, play into feelings of disgust. So when you, especially when you start thinking about taboos around things like sex and the body, um, a lot of that is going to be things that are on the list of things <laughs> just to be disgusting. Okay. Um, some of the other topics in the book are creepy crawlies. That's all of my, I've written so many things about bugs um, so that they, and, and vermin, that they <laughs> basically you know, got their own chapter. Um, and gross anatomy, that's all of my medical stuff, and mysterious minds, which is a lot of the psychology. Um, so this talk is going to touch on a lot of those themes that you see in the book. Um, so to start off with, let's talk about what is disgust. Uh, you know, someone just mentioned to me today, gosh, I never thought about disgust as an emotion, really. Um, but that's what scientists define it as. It's an emotion, a feeling, um, a feeling of aversion towards something, uh, that, that physical feeling of revulsion. And, uh, and Darwin counted it as one of the six basic emotions. So along with things like happiness and fear. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion since then about really what is disgust? Um, is it universal? Are we born with it? Do we learn it? The answer to a lot of those things is yes. Uh, <laughs> all of those things are, are kind of true. Um, it disgust turns out to be a powerful emotion um, and is thought to be, uh, you know, pretty universal among humans. So one of the ways that scientists have um, looked at disgust is to look for those commonalities. And we see commonalities across cultures uh, around the world in the expressions of disgust. So the facial, like if you're, if you're grossed out by something, what do you think is the face that you make? It's a grimace, right? And it's that squinching up. Basically, what a lot of scientists, public health experts will tell you is that that's, a, that's like a protective mechanism. What do you do? You close off all of your orifices, right? <laughs> you, you might even stick your tongue out as if there's something bad that you're spitting out of your mouth, right? Um, so it's a way of keeping things out or expelling things that are bad. 
um, you also would see a real, a true physiological response when someone is feeling disgust. Um, so like I've mentioned here, some of the, the neurological signs that you'll see, you know, um, you'll see things like nausea, lowered blood, your blood pressure drops. Um, you have that galvanic skin response is like where you basically, where you start sweating and, um, and you can measure that with electrodes. Um, and then the behavior, which is basically an aversion behavior. You're gonna drop something, you're gonna try to pull away from something, um, that kind of thing. Uh, some of it is a kind of, there's a little bit of overlap with fear. There was, you know, historically there was research kind of looking at what's the difference between disgust and fear. Um, basically, there's some overlap in the physiological response, but they are, they do seem to be distinct emotions that are elicited by particular things. Um, so you can be disgusted by something, but not afraid of it, essentially. Um, our, our Disgust sensitivity varies, even though we all tend to feel disgust, right? Like, you can go to any culture in the world and there's something that they think is disgusting. Um, some things are considered almost universally disgusting, um, but others are, um, are basically more or less learned. Um, but like we said, you know, there's, there are these kind of universal emotions that we, we all tend to feel, disgust kind of feels like one of them. But the question is, is it innate or is it learned? Um, you know, is this, is this universal because it's something that we're born with? Or is it universal because human cultures have all uh, adapted to certain threats in the same way by uh, learning these aversive behaviors? Um, you know, like I said, uh, alluded to before, the answer is kind of both, right? So there are these, these, um, tra these things that are ten tend to be universally disgusting, right? Signs of illness, body products, you know, poop. Pretty much every culture has some aversion to poop. Then again, when you think about um, babies, they, you know, it, it also, seems like to some extent that aversion is learned, right? Because babies will often play with poop or not seem to be grossed out by it at all, but we learn as we get a little bit older, like, ooh, that's yucky, don't touch that. And then it, you know, it becomes pretty ingrained pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but things like uh, body violations, that would be like, uh, think of seeing a picture of an arm that's been cut off things like that, um, decay and death, parasites, those things tend to be pretty much, pretty much universally disgusting. Like there are actual tests you can take for how easily disgusted you are by various categories of things. And most people will have some level of disgust for those kinds of, of things. More variable, food, big one. Um, Every culture has some food that it thinks is delicious and that every other culture thinks is revolting. Um, <laughs> often it's some kind of fermented food, you know, there's like we think that cheese is great, other cultures might think cheese is pretty gross. Um, there's, but then there's, of course, that seems unthinkable to us, but of course, but then you think about uh, places uh, where they eat things like fermented shark meat, like, yeah, yeah, it's gross, right? Like, uh, or, or there's a, a Spanish cheese that is um, is called maggot cheese, basically. <laughs> um, that where the the cheese is meant to be eaten with the live maggots in it. <laughs> yeah, uh, some people love it. You know, people who grew up with it love it. Delicious, uh, quite a delicacy. Um, so the point is that for a lot of things, we can learn what's disgusting and what's not disgusting, and we can adapt our feelings on that, right? Same thing with, um, to some extent, with things like what animals are disgusting, like how, how grossed out are you by insects? Mm -hmm. Would you eat an insect? Would you not eat an insect? Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of food and animals. Um, sex, 
all, all basically around the world and throughout human history, we've seen a lot of variety in sexual practice and what's considered standard, normal, uh, clean, dirty, nasty, <laughs> disgusting, not disgusting. Um, and, and then there's morals. Um, there's, we, we are probably the only species on earth that has this sense of moral disgust as well. We're gonna talk a bit more about that. Uh, because what some scientists have argued is that disgust is one of the things that sets us apart. When it's one of the things that makes us human uniquely. Um, when you think about the animal kingdom, a lot of animals you can think of having some aversion to things that could harm them, like parasites, like you know, disease. Seeing another animal that is wounded or diseased, you could imagine like, you know, there might be an aversion to that. Um, but humans are the only species that I know of that has taken disgust to the level where we've developed an entire system of manners around protecting one another from feeling disgust. So when you think about our, you know, our society evolving over time, why do we not fart in front of each other? Why do we, <laughs> you know, why do we, we we, if you, you know, retraced your day and all of the things that you've done through your day, you'll, you'll start to be quite surprised by all of the things you, you've done because of your manners, because you are protecting other people from being disgusted by your bodily functions, by anything that you could do that might be disgusting to others. Um, so I'm standing here wearing deodorant and, <laughs> you know, uh, having sh freshly showered and and groomed myself, um, and and I am going to really try not to like fart in front of you, and I'm going to try not to burp in front of you, or do anything else that might seriously gross you out. Even though those are all perfectly normal bodily functions, but we have made them something to be embarrassed about, and we've made them the subject of our in, our entire elaborate system of manners to protect one another. In fact, we've gone so far with it that we have a sense of moral disgust. When you ask people about their political views, for example, um, they will often say, and this is not just Americans, this is quite cross-cultural. Um, in fact, I think the Dutch were very, were very high, scored very high on being disgusted by politicians. Um, so it's not a uniquely American thing, but I think Americans can all relate to this, that uh, political parties will often say that they f they're disgusted mm -hmm. by the views or behavior of people in the opposing party. Um, so this obviously means disgust is something that can influence us. It's a powerful emotion, something that may influence us in ways we're not recognizing day to day. Um, affecting our decisions about health, about food, about what we eat, about our politics. And because of that, that can lead to all kinds of medical myths, misconceptions, and irrational fears. So let's talk about some of those, uh, starting with how this can influence our thinking on politics. Uh, this was a story that was published in The Atlantic a while back. Liberals and conservatives react in wildly different ways to repulsive pictures. Um, I, I, when I started seeing um, research on this topic, I, I was you know, pretty skeptical, actually. <laughs> um, is, is it really possible that liberals and conservatives um, have different res discussed responses and that that actually influences us in any meaningful way? Well, I'm not the only person who thought it was interesting. There's actually been a pretty large body of research on this subject, with scientists even going so far as to do fMRI studies with the brain and so forth and look at the different responses that people have and then asking them about their uh, political views and so forth. And this particular study found 
that remarkably brain responses to a single disgusting stimulus. So that would be like looking at a really gross <coughs> picture um, of maybe like body parts or something. Um, that, that the brain's response to a single disgusting image would be sufficient to make accurate predictions about an individual subject's political ideology. So basically you could predict from someone's disgust response whether they were more likely to be um, to describe themselves as politically conservative or liberal. Um, there's been some, um, some more recent research that has delved a little farther into this, and what I will say is I, think, I do think that there is, there's something to it, right? We see over and over again in a lot of studies that people with more conservative uh, worldviews Tend to be, tend to rate more highly on disgust sensitivity. So they're more easily disgusted. And so I do think there's something to that, but I think that it's also, um, based on some research recently, I think it's, it's also, there's some nuance there. Um, it's not necessarily that liberals are all not easily disgusted. I know plenty of squeamish liberals. <laughs> And it's not necessarily that all conservatives are, um, are the most squeamish people you'll meet. Um, one factor is that there's some there have been some differences found in the kinds of things that liberals or conservatives find disgusting. Um, you might find, for example, that conservatives um, are more easily disgusted by things having to do with uh, sex um, and liberals more have been found sometimes to be more disgusted by um, the moral disgust to the ideology types of things. Um, so being fe reporting feeling disgusted by uh, racist behavior, for example. So you know, so some of it is just what you're disgusted by, um, a a as well as how dis easily disgusted you are. But we do see that you know that over and over again there have been some of these studies that I mentioned here. Uh, that find these, you know, pretty consistent uh, differences in people politically. Uh. <laughs> Is that you? <yours>? Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't help but throw in a few examples um, from our our current political situation in the U.S. Um, because this is something that has actually started to be noticed more the use of disgust, disgust as a tool for influencing political behavior. So you, you know, enough studies come out showing that conservatives react uh, strongly to messages of, that elicit disgust. Well, you know, gosh, that seems like a tool you could use. Um, and one person who has uh, been noted in the press uh, as being particularly um, good at using disgust uh, in their rhetoric is Donald Trump. So this is an article from the New Republic uh, about Donald Trump and the politics of disgust. And just a few examples of some of the, the language that you could you know, start to look out for and see how some of the rhetoric could elicit feelings of disgust. So, for example, calling Mexicans rapists and criminals, saying immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country, um, calling people vermin. Um, those are all things that trigger those, you know, words like vermin, that triggers our disgust for all kinds of things that cause disease, right? Um, disgust is essentially a protective mechanism Right? We're disgusted by a lot of things that could hurt us. And so when you think about how that can be used politically uh, and in speech, it's pretty easy to trigger someone's you know, fear or sense of self-protection by invoking their disgust. Um, lest anyone think that this is only for Republicans, uh, no, this is actually uh, af right, right after Donald Trump got elected in 2016, I believe it was, a skywriter wrote 
-hmm. in the sky um, with an airplane, America is great, Trump is disgusting. And, and you know, in this headline, we see Biden campaign likens, um, likens Trump's comments to Hitler. Um, Hitler is easy for disgust, you know. <laughs> As one person uh, uh, mentioned earlier, you know, people will, will associate, if you just associate Hitler with an object, that object becomes disgusting, revolting, repulsive, stay away from it, right? So, um, so certainly both sides uh, are, are capable of using disgust um, in political rhetoric. Now, why does it work? <laughs> well, I think it gets back to a theme that a lot of skeptics touch on, which is magical thinking. This is beliefs, a set of beliefs that two unrelated events or phenomena are connected and affect each other, right? And that, it's basically how we try to make sense of the world, how we try to explain things. Something that we see must be a ghost because we can't explain it otherwise. Um, and we make connections between things. So uh, researchers like Paul Rosen of University of Pennsylvania, who who's considered kind of the father of disgust research and just has studied a lot, um, talks about some of the laws, what he calls the laws of sympathetic magic, um, which is part of this magical thinking where we, we have the law of similarity, where appearance is reality. And I'll give examples of these in a moment. So if they don't make a lot of sense, just hang on. Um, law of similarity says that appearance is reality. And the law of contagion says that once in contact, always in contact. That's kind of like the Hitler's hat example, right? Um, so a couple of examples. There were Paul Rosen, this, this researcher I mentioned, he did uh, a series of really interesting experiments in the 90s um, looking into this. And one of the examples that he gave of the law of similarity is this lovely, yummy piece of chocolate, right? So don't you want to eat this piece of chocolate? No, you don't. You don't want to eat the piece of chocolate because it looks like a piece of poop. And so the law of similarity is telling you that appearance is reality, that if it looks like poop, it is poop. And even though you know perfectly logically that it's chocolate, it's hard to overcome the feeling, the visceral reaction, that because it looks like poop, it's gonna taste like poop, right? Likewise, the law of contagion in the set of experiments was demonstrated when a cockroach, a dead, sterilized cockroach, okay, wasn't actually gonna hurt you, but was dunked into some apple juice, and then people were offered a choice of, you can have the apple juice that had the roach in it, or you can have the other thing. Of course, 100% of people want the other thing. Um, but interestingly, even later, you can take a fresh, open up a fresh container of apple juice, pour it into a fresh, clean glass, no roach involved whatsoever, and then offer people the same choice. Do you want the apple juice, or do you want the grape juice? They want the grape, they don't even, they still don't want the apple juice just because they previously saw a separate glass of apple juice be contaminated. And so that law of contagion is that contagion is very sticky. Once something is contaminated, it's contaminated forever. <laughs> and just the idea of it, of it being contaminated can basically be passed along. Okay. Uh, that influences <laughs> our decisions about things like what to eat as well. So um, in the same kind of series of experiments, Rosin had uh, students do a set of 28 disgusting tasks. This, I, I loved this research. This was great. <laughs> reading this paper, reading this paper was like perfect. Um, so this was not a theoretical experiment. You, it, the tasks were actually presented to people, and if you said that you would do it, you had to do it. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a double dog dare. So, um, and this was to rate how disgusting people found different things, right? So, eating insects turned out to be one of the one of the top things that people were disgusted by. 
more people were willing to, and again, literally physically, stick a pin in a dead pig's eye. They had a, they had a dead pig's head, and they were like, would you stick this pin in the dead pig's eye? More people were willing to do that than to touch a live mealworm to their lips. I would be the 21%. I would be the 9%, but you know, that's just me. So um, just to make the point that, you know, that this is a very powerful emotion, it doesn't always make sense. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and it influences our, our decisions. So, you know, eating insects, high protein, very nutritious. I went to an entire conference in Georgia about how insects sh should be basically the food of the future and how much better for the environment and our health it would be. And overcoming the gross factor is just, it may never happen, right? At least for Americans, where we're not used to it. That's the conference. So with my last couple minutes, I'm just gonna run through a couple of examples and you can ask me about them if you're interested later. Um, some of the things that I've written about that are in the book or that, are, uh, that I've written about elsewhere um, that relate to disgust in our decisions and dis in some sense skepticism um, are things like uh, all the different bodily fluids and stuff, our disgust about our bodies. Um, this is one of my personal pet peeves. Um, this thing about sweating out toxins, like you will just see this everywhere. And it's just total BS. And so I wrote an article for Nat Geo about it, um, about what BS it is that basically you're not, you're, you're, the toxins that you're worried about, you know, the bisphenol A, the metals, whatever, they're, they're just not carried by water. They're fat, fat soluble, you can't sweat them out efficiently at all. And so people paying for really fancy infrared spa treatments and stuff where you're supposed to sweat out all your toxins, like it's just nonsense. Um, so that's one of my pet peeves, but you can see why it appeals to people because if there's a toxin, it's gross and I want it out of me. And so, you know, we're susceptible to that. That's why people are still into bloodletting and cupping, all these things. Um, people, st people will not stop drinking their own urine and, <laughs> <laughs> and peeing on wounds and jellyfish stings and I don't know, uh, like we're just fascinated by it. Um, we're held back in the field of fecal transplants, which are really actually important and probably the best treatment for C. difficile infections. Um, again, because of the gross factor, because you have to transplant poop from one person to another. And then another of my personal um, pet topics is the female body and um, I, anyone who ends up buying my book or reading my book, I strongly encourage them to read the section, the, the story, Pioneering the Clitoris, and, um, which is about the lack of study of female sexual anatomy, basically, and the fact that it was not until the 1990s that we had a complete map of the clitoris and female sexual anatomy, mm -hmm. complete with nerves and all of the, all of the parts which we knew quite well for men. So um, again, things like menstruation, so forth, are topics that are often considered embarrassing, disgusting, and that turn people off from even studying or understanding for women their own bodies. Um, and for men, there's, uh, if I'm gonna get on my bully pulpit in a minute. Plenty of willingness to regulate human female bodies, yeah. not a lot of interest in actually understanding how they work. Um, and certainly some squeamishness about it on the parts of, of some male leg legislators. Um, <laughs> uh, and another topic that I don't have time to go into too much today is uh, delusions of infestation, which is a surprisingly common um, affliction I'd be surprised if someone here hasn't had uh, some interaction with someone who became convinced that they were infested with parasites um, or insects of some sort. And it's really sad, and I think it really plays into, it really happens because of our sense of disgust. We're so freaked out by the idea of insects on us 
or in us that, um, that it makes, it basically can upend people's lives when they become convinced of this, sort of like Morgellon syndrome where people have the fibers. So anyway, I think we should all, em we should all embrace the gross. <laughs> And I thank you. <laughs> All right. We've got time for just one or two questions, okay. and then we've got a book signing with Erica. Okay. Yeah. You, you can ask me more questions then. Yeah. Uh, you showed a picture in the, the first, um, at first, about people's reaction to disgust. Yeah. Is that common across cultures? Yes. Yes. Okay. You will see the same basic facial expression, and physiological response across cultures. I, I just have one question about that university study where they asked the students to do all those gross things. Yeah. Why? <laughs> what, 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 what was the point of the study? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in the broader sense, the, the point was they were looking, they were trying to establish a scale of disgust and different categories and trying to look at what things were more or less disgusting uh, to, to people, and so it was, I think that study had a lot to do with like the universality of disgust and, and you know, a lot of people gravitated toward the same things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one more. One more. Yep. Oh, um, Uh, do you have a sense of whether um, you think disgust has increased in our culture? Uh, like overall, uh, yeah, has society become uh, more disgusted? <laughs> Were we more disgusted in the past in, in the U.S. or other places? You know, that's a great question. Um, and I don't think anyone has done any kind, because how do you really do that study? We've only really been studying disgust in any kind of really scientific fashion since the 90s and I don't know that you would necessarily see a trend since then. Um, but I would guess that it's more about the kinds of things that people find disgusting rather than how easily disgusted they are. I think some things, you know, like the body stuff and the poop and whatever, I think that stuff is, that probably goes way back, right? Um, but I think that this more finely tuned sense of moral disgust and, um, I, you know, the more ideological stuff, that probably has, is more cultural and shifts more with our culture. And so I would, I'm, this is just purely my own opinion and guess at this point, but like as far as the political disgust stuff that I was talking about, I, I personally think that it is on the rise in the US in particular because of its use in political rhetoric in the last, 10 years, um, but that's not, a that's not a scientific study, that's just, in my observation, it just seems like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing it everywhere now, and um, you know, I think that, that Trump probably pushed some of that, um, but certainly others are gonna come back with the same kinds of, the same kinds of rhetoric, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, or what, political strategies should be, you know, I'm not a political analyst, I can't say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Arjun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay.